Vanessa, really, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. It is a really pleasure to speak with you. And I invited you to Syriana Analysis again uh, because um, the important topic, which is Germany granted asylum to a senior White Helmets uh, member, <coughs> which they call him here in Germany a rescue member or a rescue uh -huh. employee from the White Helmets. And I've been following the news in uh, in Germany, and I haven't seen yet uh, investigation about um, this person, his background, or his links to radical groups, despite um, the heated debate between the Interior Ministry in Germany, Interior Ministry and the Foreign uh, Ministry. And the Interior Ministry was against um, get, granting him an asylum, but obviously the Foreign Ministry, which is uh, nowadays led by the SPD, the Social uh, Democratic Party, they uh, send uh, a government plane to bring him in, in Germany. So uh, what do we know about Khaled Saleh, this uh, person himself and his position role in the White Helmet? <laughs> Um, well, we know only really what has been reported uh, in the media. The first report I saw, of course, was in the BBC, um, and where they did actually admit that originally he was not allowed to be resettled in Canada, Germany or the UK because of his links to uh, terrorist groups inside Syria. Now, of course... This ties in um, with an announcement made by a member of parliament in Jordan, Tarek Kouri, in uh, December 2018, so about five months after the evacuation of the White Helmets and armed groups by Israel uh, out of southern Syria and then their uh, transportation into Jordan, where they were kept in uh, settlements before being um, patriated to, as I say, the agreement was with Canada. Uh, the evacuation was pretty much organized by Canada um, and Germany and the UK. Now, um, Tarek Khouri, at this point, um, at this point, we didn't know how many of the White Helmets had been settled in those three countries. We knew that um, from Tarek Khouri and from the authorities in Jordan, we knew that there were originally 429, uh, not all white helmets, but a mixture of white helmets and armed groups that had been evacuated. Um, of those 377 people had been uh, settled elsewhere. And so that was leaving, uh, around 52, if my maths is correct. Now, at this point, Tarek Khouri was actually calling on um, the Jordanian government to repatriate those remaining white helmets to Syria to face prosecution for their allegiances with terrorist groups. So this was a very clear statement put out by the Jordanian uh, MP. And I spoke to him after this announcement. He said, you know, it is disgusting that we are harboring terrorists on Jordanian territory. Uh, they should face trial in Syria for the extensive damage they've done to Syria and to the Syrian people for the last uh, 10 years. Uh -huh. So for me, it's very clear that um, with the BBC admission that Khaled al Salah had uh, previously been uh, considered to be connected to terrorist groups, um, the announcement by the Jordanian MP make it very clear to me that, that this guy uh, has uh, terrorist uh, origins. And yet here he is, as you say, being given red carpet treatment uh, for his entry into Germany, which is extraordinary. Yeah, just to give some context, <laughs> the years uh, Jordan between 2012 till two uh, and 2018 was on the anti-Syrian camp. So... Mm -hmm. uh, statement that comes from an MP who, which belongs to the uh, Jordanian parliament should be taken seriously because um, uh, in the previous period, uh, Jordan was supporting uh, the terrorist groups uh, asked by the CIA uh, to support it. But for starters, uh, Vanessa, because a lot of people who follow my channel, maybe they don't know much about the White Helmets, why there is so much content see over uh, the white helmets. Uh, can you please briefly tell us about the organization? <laughs> I love it when someone asks me to say briefly what the organization is, but I will try to keep it really brief. 
basically, uh, the white helmets were created in 2013. They were established, actually, first of all, in Turkey and Jordan, established by a former British intelligence military officer, James Lazurier, who died in suspicious circumstances in November 2019. <clears throat> Basically, the creation of the White Helmets was part of the UK Foreign Office um, exercise or intelligence operation to provide um, publicity, public relations and media support for the armed groups uh, that they deemed uh, moderate opposition inside Syria. Those groups, of course, included uh, organizations like Jaish al-Islam, uh, Ar al-Sham, uh, all uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIS link that carried out atrocities against Syrian civilians. The White Helmets were embedded exclusively um, with those armed groups and were there effectively to provide the propaganda to criminalize and demonize the Syrian government, Syrian army and its allies. And of course, um, they were there to produce what is in Syria, the weapons of mass destruction narrative, um, the chemical weapon narrative. So the white helmets were, were effectively, I believe, created um, to manufacture the chemical weapon attack narratives that of course have been used to increase um, economic pressure, military pressure, political pressure against the Syrian government and its allies. And they were, I think, successful uh, in Khan Shekhon and in Duma, and uh, all fingers are pointed to the white helmets in faking uh, chemical attacks in these uh, particular two uh, towns or cities, and which led later to um, foreign aggression in Khan Shekhon. Yeah. Bombed uh, Syria, and after Doma incident in 2018, uh, uh, France, Britain, and the uh, and uh, United States again bombed Syria. And now we know through whistleblowers inside the OPCW and experts who were in the fact fact finding mission that uh, their uh, findings were either removed or distorted from the reports of the OPCW administration by the OPCW administration. So it's it, you feel like there is a big mafia of uh, um, I don't want to call it the conspiracy, but it's a consistent work uh, by these by these people to um, blame the Syrian government for using chemical weapons. Although Syria officially gave up its arsenal uh, in an international deal in 2013 and 2014, yeah. but for starters, uh, Vanessa, because you also mentioned that the White Helmets has links to radical groups. It's very important for me uh, to know, is there a link between uh, the White Helmets and Al-Qaeda or the Al-Nusra Fund? Because you were in Syria and you investigated this case. Yeah, I mean, there's two instances that I would like to talk about here. First of all, um, was in 2017, I carried out an investigation with Khaled Iskaif, uh, a Syrian journalist in Aleppo, where we found um, papers connecting um, one of the leaders of Al-Qaeda in East Aleppo, uh, Abdulaziz Maghrebi, who was also a member of Al-Tawid um, armed brigades that uh, initially invaded uh, Aleppo in 2012. Um, he was also heading up what was uh, euphemistically called the local councils in East Aleppo. Now, the local councils were effectively funded and sponsored and supported, again, as part of this UK Foreign Office intelligence uh, black op against Syria for the last 10 years. And of course, we also have to be very clear here that, that this uh, operation to remove the Syrian government started long before 2011. If we go back to the Bush Blair communiques, if we go back to um, Professor Jeffrey Sachs talking about um, Operation Timber Sycamore, etc., and Roland Dumas exposing um, the British Foreign Office, telling him in 2009 that they would be fomenting an uprising in Syria. So, just to be very clear to people that this isn't something that, you know, we've just discovered. Historically, Britain has targeted Syria alongside the rest of the U.S. coalition for destabilization and regime change. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, effectively, the local councils were being funded by two organizations, uh, Integrity Consulting and Adam Smith International. Sorry, I'm having to go through my memory here. 
But those two organizations were being funded by the UK Foreign and Northwest Conflict Stability and Security Fund, which also, by the way, funds Mayday Rescue, which then siphons that money to the White Helmet. So you can start to see the, the web of intrigue that is building here, funded and sponsored by the UK Foreign Office. Now, Abdulaziz Maghribi headed up the local council. So effectively, he was being funded by the British government to do so via an outreach agent. Um, he was also, and this is all documented, he was the leader of Al-Qaeda and of Abu Amada, which was one of the most vicious and brutal um, sidekicks of Al-Qaeda in East Aleppo. At the same time, <laughs> he was elected head of the White Helmets in that area. <laughs> So this starts to build the picture. The, the UK Foreign Office is funding and providing PR and media for the armed groups, i.e. Al-Qaeda and affiliates. I, I mean, I think you agree with me. I, I don't tend to see a difference between the various brands of the armed groups. I tend to see it as, a, as an overarching mafia operation. They fight among themselves for money, for influence, um, for territory, like for power. Coca-Cola, for me, yeah. it's, it's not uh, different. The ideologies are the same, the brands the are different. The ideology is the same, yeah, exactly. The, the difference is in the amount of funding they're getting, the amount of equipment, the amount of weapons, and the amount of status and power they're given by their Western handlers, basically. But the other story that I wanted to mention, because one of the criticisms has always been that I don't go and talk to the White Helmets, that I don't talk to the, oppo the opposition, um, but um, I actually entered an operating white helmet um, organization in Dara al Balad um, at the stage when uh, amnesty and reconciliation was being negotiated by the Russians. Now, speaking to the head of that white helmet center, he effectively told me, he said, look, here we're not Nusra Front, okay? He, he made that very clear to me. He assumed I'm a British journalist. He was actually pushing me to try and get their funding given back to them because they hadn't received any money from Britain for about six months. So he was actually kind of marketing himself to me in order to turn back on the British funding tap to this particular group in Dar al Balad. Um, but what he was very quick to say was, look, if any white helmet group is headed up by a Nusra Front, uh, remember, the whole group will be Nusra Front. The whole group will follow that same ideology. And he said there were many groups, basically. He said, I think from memory, he said to the west of Dara, so I guess that could, this could mean in, in any of those areas where the White Helmets were operating. But this was a very clear statement from an operating White Helmet that perceived me as a British journalist and someone who would be on his side. So he wasn't trying to, to hide anything or to keep anything from me at this stage. From what you said, uh, Vanessa, because you mentioned the British support to the White Helmets, and we know there is a financial support, logistical support, not only from the UK, but UK is the main, uh, let's say, uh, power behind the White Helmets. But obviously, uh, Britain refused to receive Khalid Saleh as a refugee, and uh, it's only Germany who received him. Uh, why do you think uh, UK refused him and Germany accepted him? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. I think the UK is saying, yeah, okay, but we only want the good white helmets back, you know. I mean, look, in some cases, I mean, I've interviewed former white helmets, for example, in Duma. Now, these guys were very simple guys uh, who were given the choice of joining the White Helmets or joining Jaish al-Islam or whatever other armed group was operating in the towns or cities where they were. These White Helmets who were in the minority, most of them took amnesty and reconciliation because they wanted to stay in the area they lived, where their family was, etc. Um, <clears throat> but the White Helmets... Um, that left obviously with the armed groups and that was the majority. So they left with Al-Qaeda, Jaish al-Islam, al Sham when they were evacuated to Idlib, um, following on from the liberation of certain areas, like for example, Eastern Ghouta. Um, <clears throat> the British government is perfectly aware, in my opinion, that the majority of the White Helmets adhere to extremist sectarian terrorist ideology. 
Um, they are linked to groups like Al Qaeda, as I said, Ad al Sham, Jaish al Islam, all of which have carried out terrorist acts inside Syria. That, that's a fact. Um, the fact that this was one of the white helmets that was left behind, so it wasn't kind of farmed out to, to Canada, um, that took the majority to um, Germany and the UK. We still don't actually know exactly how many of the original batch of white helmets that left southern Syria ended up in the UK. We don't know. We know a few came in, but not as many as to Germany and Canada. And of course, the US took, took none. <laughs> right, so <laughs> the U.S. was not going to risk bringing radical elements back onto its own um, territory. And what is really interesting about Khaled al Salah? Now, we know that Rayad al Salah, um, who is the leader of the White Helmets, is, I believe, now settled in Germany. Okay, it could be a major coincidence that the surname is the same. I know in Syria, you know, families are huge and, and there isn't necessarily a connection, but it, it struck me immediately because the, the, his evacuation to Germany was actually organized between King Abdullah and Merkel, according to the reports that I read today. So this was a pretty major, you know, this was a pretty major step. So either Jordan is saying, we don't want this guy on Jordanian territory. Yeah. Someone has to take him. And then Britain has passed the buck or, or Britain and Canada have passed the buck to Germany. I'm not really sure, but I think we also have to remember the case in 2016 of Jabba al-Bakr. If you remember the, the um, suicide bomber who yes. had been given asylum in Germany. And then I believe he'd actually managed to get back into Turkey. He'd volunteered with the White Helmets in Idlib. Sure. And then he'd come back and he'd been arrested for a potential uh, suicide bombing at um, Berlin Airport, right? Yes. So, you know, this is a very important fact. Yeah. And, and then I think he committed suicide again. Yeah, he did. Yeah, it's a, weirdly. <laughs> All these people are committing suicide, like James uh, Le Mesurier and now uh, the other uh, terrorists from the White Helmet. Uh, Vanessa, this is important because in Germany, uh, some people might say, like, okay, maybe they have a radical ideology, these White Helmets, but they didn't commit crimes, uh, actual crimes. Have the members of the White Helmets committed crimes or as an organization in Syria? Have they committed actual war crimes in Syria? I think, I mean, that is something um, that should be investigated. And of course, it's not being investigated. <clears throat> Maxime Grigoriev has done an exhaustive um, study of the White Helmets and of the crimes they are accused of by Syrian civilians that lived under their occupation alongside the various armed groups. Now, those crimes consist of um, organ trafficking, child ab abduction, I mean, I have spoken to a family in Aleppo, for example, who told me that the White Helmets had taken their child. Um, he was, if I remember, uh, he, he had uh, impaired hearing and they managed to take him. And the parents knew from information inside Idlib that the White Helmets were moving these kids that they had kidnapped around to use them um, for chemical weapon staging. Um, they've been accused, obviously, of um, participating in torture. We've seen videos of them um, cleaning up after the terrorist groups have um, summarily executed prisoners of war, um, tortured prisoners of war. Um, so we know that while this group is tasked by the British government and the US coalition to document war crimes, they are often present when the armed groups are committing war crimes. And yet I can guarantee you will not find one single report. You will not even find one single tweet by the White Helmets condemning any of the war crimes committed by the groups they're embedded with. So even if the White Helmets are not directly committing war crimes, and I believe they are, um, they are accessory uh -huh. to war crimes. Right. And this is a very important point to make. The other really important point to make is that while, of course, any accusation against the Syrian government by a Syrian outside Syria is taken seriously, none of the accusations by Syrians inside Syria that had lived through this 10 year war are taken seriously by the so-called humanitarian uh, organizations outside Syria. 
you know, they are completely disappeared. They're ignored. Their, their opinion, um, their suffering is completely discounted by the media, by the UN, by organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. Uh -huh. Okay, so these groups were operating in Syria, but some senior members of them are now resettled in different European cities or Canada and Germany, etc. Do you believe that these uh, members of the White Helmet could pose any security threat to the European uh, countries? Of course, yes. You know, the recent spate of um, terrorist attacks throughout Europe, who do you think is doing them? You know, it, whether it's radicals coming into Europe from outside that have been trained and sponsored and equipped by the US coalition, or whether it's um, radicals inside Europe that have been radicalized by outside forces like the Saudi uh, clerics that are coming in and radicalizing Muslims. We know this as a fact in, in France, for example. So whatever is happening here, the radicals that are coming in, this ideology doesn't, it, it doesn't change. You know, this ideology it is completely imprinted uh -huh. in their psyche. It doesn't go away at any given opportunity. They will turn against the hand that feeds them. Um, and I think, you, you know, Europeans need to be aware that their governments are putting their lives at risk as they put Syrian lives at risk. Um, by allowing these radicals to, to expand, uh, arming them, equipping them, sponsoring them, whitewashing them for 10 years inside Syria. These guys are now, many of them are now in Europe and their ideology hasn't changed. In my opinion, uh, Vanessa, they are useful tools for yeah. some of the European governments. And when they come back, or they resettle in Europe, they might pose a security threat for, but for the European governments, maybe they consider this just a collateral damage uh, after achieving major geopolitical goals in the Middle East and North Africa. So uh, 10 people or 20 people die per year after due to terrorist attacks is something maybe bearable for uh, these governments. Uh, if we compare to hundreds of thousands of people die uh, due to this uh, ideology. My last uh, question, Vanessa, are you pessimistic enough like me uh, that in to extent that you, believe, you also believe that no German uh, journalist will investigate <laughs> this case and lose his or her job in Germany? I would be very pleasantly surprised if any journalist, not only German, uh, any journalist, um, British, look, you know, we've just had the case of Mark Rutte, the, the, um, the Netherlands prime minister, basically blocking an investigation into his own government's yeah. funding of terrorist groups inside, um, uh, inside Syria, which include, um, I can never remember the first one, um, which include Ad al Sham. Mm. Um, and so... The, the job yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I would be very pleasantly shocked mm. if any mainstream media journalist investigates um, the terrorist ties that Khaled al Salah had, which have suddenly been erased from all reports of his settlement in Germany. Only the BBC, which is ironic after their May Day series to try and kind of shore up the White Helmet narrative, 15 hours of um, <laughs> of whitewashing and protectionism for the White Helmet. Um, they actually mentioned that Khaled al Salah was originally not settled anywhere outside Jordan because of his suspected terrorist. Um, and, and that was after they had sent a team to investigate him and to look into his mobile phone. So clearly they found something. Yes. Right. But, but um, my only yeah. wish is uh, that in Germany there would be some journalists who would dare to investigate the background of uh, this uh, White Helmets member the same way they investigated my background and they claimed that I'm a propaganda warrior for Assad or 
yeah, my, my dog is crying anyways. <laughs> and they called me propaganda warrior for Assad and that I may be sent by Assad or someone else in, in, in Germany to adopt his uh, policy. So I'm, I wish, yeah. but I have no really. I have no hope in, in that. Vanessa Billy, thank you very much uh, for accepting my invitation. We will, of course, host you again on Syriana Analysis. And I hope uh, my the followers of Syriana Analysis would watch this and also spread it with their friends, especially in Germany. And those who are, not, who, those who are new on Syriana Analysis, I invite you to subscribe. It really helps me a lot. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you.